Muslims, they are facing discrimination, marginalization, and the kind of torturous treatment which is being meted out under the supervision of the authorities over there in India. Specifically, when we talk about the holy month of Ramadan, when the Muslims happen to be uh, pretty much upbeat and enthusiastic about their uh, religious activities, uh, they've been uh, tortured, they've been attacked, and uh, the hooligans and the goons of various Hindu organizations have carried out these uh, attacks against them. Uh, a number of attacks, uh, let me bring in all of these uh, in front of you. On 4th of April, specifically when we talk about Hindu extremists uh, stopped Muslims from offering the Rabi prayer in Haldwani city of Uttarakhand. Now, as per the reports, more than 60 members of an uh, extremist organization, Bajrang Dal, um, attacked the mosque and when there was a complaint registered with the police of the area, uh, rather than taking any action against the perpetrators of this particular attack, uh, they sealed the half premises of the mosque. Uh, also, some reports suggest that around 31 incidents of stopping Muslims from offering their prayers uh, during uh, the holy month of Ramadan have been uh, reported from various parts of India. On 24th of March, uh, again, Bajrang Dal goons in Muradabad stopped Muslims from offering their Isha prayers and Tarabi on 24th and 26th in Noida. Uh, they stopped Muslims again from offering Tarabi on 31st of March in Bihar. Uh, they set the Madrasa Azizia uh, ablaze uh, during their own religious festival. On 1st of April in Hyderabad, uh, hooliganism uh, during the namaz -e tarawi was also reported on 4th of April when we talk about the Jharkhand state, uh, Hazari Bagh Mosque. Um, the uh, attackers attacked the worshippers. Not only this, they also tortured them and also broke the main gate of the mosque. Now, regarding these incidents, the Human Rights Watch says that the Hindu extremists use these uh, religious festivals in particular to target and torture Muslims. Um, at the same time, we have seen an NGO that works in India that is known as SPECT Foundation in its report has highlighted how Muslims in uh, 10 districts of states that include Bihar, Assam and West Bengal suffer from abject multidimensional poverty. Uh, we have also seen from Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir that the Jamia Masjid Committee in Islamabad district uh, of the Held Valley says the BJP regime has banned Eid congregation at Eidgah in South Kashmir's Islamabad district. Also, uh, we have uh, seen that all parties Suryat conference uh, in in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir has also appealed to the United Nations and international human rights organizations to pressure India to release detainees in Indian and Kashmiri jails where they face torture by the uh, forces and authorities. Last but not the least, uh, the Congress party has also demanded a white paper regarding the Pulwama attack after the shocking and stunning revelations which were made by former governor of IIOJK, Mr. Satyapal Malik. Uh, to talk about this miserable situation of Muslims, the kind of marginalization, the discrimination, the brutal torture they are facing by the Hindu extremists in India and also the high handedness of Indian authorities in IIO JK. We are honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Air Vice Marshal, retired Ijaz Malik, his senior analyst. Mr. Malik, thank you very much thank for talk, uh, taking time out uh, for views on news tonight. We really appreciate that. Also, in the studio, we are being joined by Mr. Javed Siddiq, his senior journalist. Mr. Siddiq, thank Thank you very much for your time also for being with us on Views on News tonight. We really appreciate that. On Skype, uh, we are being joined by Mr. Abid Latif Sindhu, his senior analyst. Mr. Abid, uh, thank you very much for your time also for being with us on the show tonight. We really appreciate that. Let me begin the discussion with you, uh, Mr. Malik. Now, back to back incidents of attack and stopping the Muslims in particular uh, during the holy month of Ramadan from offering prayers, especially Tarawi. They've been attacked, they've been tortured, even the mosques have been set ablaze. And this is happening with impunity under the supervision of the BJP authorities who is going to stop these groups.
This is very unfortunate and it should be condemned, uh, obviously. But the problem is, this is not, uh, it should not be viewed only as a stand-alone, uh, you know, series of incidents during the holy month of Ramadan. This is the continuation of the campaign, a planned campaign, which has been, uh, uh, you know, just being executed uh, ever since the present uh, re regime took over the reins in the New Delhi. Uh, they have uh, an agenda uh, of Hinduata. And they are doing all these things very systematically. And probably their objective is to slowly uh, and raise the, uh, 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 the tempo to a level where all minorities, particularly the Muslims, who are being the largest part of the uh, minority in the Indian uh, Union, uh, they want to terrorize them so as they are... They, they so they are forced to do what? Forced in they are forced to do what in return? No, not Either to react? Uh, they should, uh, you know, not resist anything which is, you know, be done by these extremists. And also they want to give a message, in my reckoning, they want to give a message to the Muslims in uh, illegally occupied uh, state of Jammu and Kashmir, that if we can do all this uh, in broad daylight to our own citizen in India, to minorities, so, uh, uh, your fate is written on the wall. So, and don't you think the Indian authorities realize the gravity of the situation if such type of high-handedness and tactics are being continuously carried out against a certain minority? Uh, they would uh, have no other choice to react, and that reaction could also be violent uh, in turn, also at times. No. But so far, they have seen uh, there hasn't been uh, any meaningful uh, resistance or uh, any. Uh, uh, there hasn't been any organized, uh, you know, uh, activity on the part of uh, these minorities to react to all these atrocities, and they are probably taking, you know, uh, there is. I can draw a very, you know, uh, uh, unfortunate uh, comparison between what Israelis are doing to Palestinians. Uh, exactly the same thing in the holy month of Ramadan. They were also stopping, and they were also, you know, uh, storming into the mosque while the pe people want to pray. And the entire international community, uh, nobody, uh, you know, ever bothered to uh, condemn them either. So the same thing is happening uh, in the context of uh, our, uh, you know, neighbors. And unfortunately, uh, the uh, although the information era and technology and uh, all the social media and everything, a global village, but uh, we, uh, we fail to see any reaction from anybody, as a matter of fact, apart from few uh, human rights, uh, you know, activist or organizations. Right, uh, Mr. Siddiq, when we talk about there is a certain incident on 4th of April, the Hindu extremists stopped the Muslims from offering Taraweeh prayer. Uh, in Uttarakhand. Now, um, there were 60 hooligans or the goons of uh, Bajrang Dal who attacked this particular mosques and they also tortured the worshippers over there. When there was a complaint registered against them, rather than taking an action against those uh, perpetrators, um, the premises of the mosque were sealed. Isn't it laughable? Well, <coughs> ever since uh, Narendra Modi has come to power in India with his Hindutva philosophy, and the RSS mindset, the life for the Muslims of the Indians have become miserable. Uh, they are being subjected to torture. They are being butchered. You know, Moody himself, when he was chief minister of Gujarat, uh, he butchered and he ordered to butcher 2,000 Muslims in Gujarat. And that's why he was known as the butcher of Gujarat. And on that basis, the United States of America refused visa to, Mo to Modi to enter the United States of America. Later on, yes, they have forged an alliance and now they are strategic partners. But Modi's track record vis-a-vis -vis Muslims is miserable, is condemnable, is despicable. And I think that is the tragedy, that this gentleman within Kamas, he is now the Prime Minister of India, and as you have mentioned in Uttarakhand, the mosque was uh, attacked, raided, and uh, the books later on, the books were burned, and the, the worshippers, uh, they were subjected to violence, 
and the magistrate, as you have mentioned, later on sealed the mosque instead of taking action against those 60 hooligans who had raided the mosque. So, and in, in India, in the month of Ramadan, 31 incidents have taken place in which the Hindu extremists have stopped Muslims from praying in the mosque or they stopped the Taravi prayers uh, by force. So the religious minorities in India are suffering and the Muslims are the worst among all of these people. So, so nobody talks about it uh, within India. I mean, uh, we understand that there is a supervision of the uh, government authorities behind these uh, extremist organizations which are carrying out these particular activities against the Muslims in particular with impunity, uh, but must be quite some saner voices within India, even among the yeah. Hindu ranks also. Some Not all the Hindus would be extremists. Exactly. Why don't they talk about it? Some people like Arundhati Rai, and a couple of other journalists, they have the raised, they raised their voice, but they have been silenced. They are being persecuted. And that is why, you know, the Hindu majority in India and the Hindu owned newspapers and media is silent on this. The United States of America every year comes out with a report on human rights globally. And in the recent report, they have taken note of this that the minorities, religious minorities in India are being subjected to uh, unprecedented violence, torture, and they are being denied the opportunity to uh, live life according to their religious beliefs. That's very unfortunate. But the, uh, the, the United States and the European Union, the United Nations itself, the United Nations Human Rights Council, they are not taking any stern action against India. On, this, uh, on these viol uh, violations of, uh, you know, religious uh, uh, minorities and uh, they are, what they are doing and what m uh, treatment they are meeting out to the minorities in India. Even Sikhs and Christians and others are also being tortured. They are being deprived of their religious rights. The Muslims are the prime target of uh, these Hindu hooligans, Hindu extremists and RSS uh, you know, goons. That is very unfortunate. And, the, and I've said that Mus Muslims' life in India is extremely miserable. And uh, precisely for this reason, our forefathers, our founding fathers, Pakistan's founding fathers, had visualized uh, that as the time will pass, the Hindus will come out with their true colors. And today, the Indian Muslims who are living there are suffering and they are, uh, you know, paying the price uh, of that. And the Hindu majority is trying to impose its own will, its own Hindutva philosophy. And now they're openly saying that India is meant for Hindus only. That's why, uh, and that means they are denying space um, in all sense to Muslims, Christians, Dalits, and other minorities. Right, let me bring in Mr. Abid into the discussion also. Mr. Abid, uh, when these back-to-back -back incidents of discrimination, marginalization, and brutal torture against the Muslims continues to happen, and that worsens uh, during the holy month of Ramadan, who is going to stop these extremist groups? Over there, when we talk about the um, uh, government in India, it is supervising such type of acts uh, to be carried out with impunity. Now, uh, who is going to take the responsibility and what happened to be the options at the hands of the Muslims who are continuously uh, facing such type of treatment over there? Unfortunately, I think no one is going to uh, stop the perpetrators of this violence against the Muslims. And uh, uh, the options, as you said, what are the options for the Muslims? Again, unfortunately, there are no options for the Muslims. They just have to survive. One thing which Javed Sahib was saying, uh, that our elders, the founding fathers of Pakistan, very rightly and very timely sensed that uh, uh, the Muslims require to have an independent state. Otherwise, uh, they have to face the persecutions of the majority, which is the Hindu majority. That is why it happened. And uh, why our elders came to the conclusion, because in 1925, once RSS Rashtriya Swami uh, Seva came into being by Hajwar and he founded that. So it was a complete hierarchy. It is not only one RSS, which is actually 
you know, transforming the complete Hindu society. Uh, under the RSS, uh, there is VHP, which is the Vishwa Hindu Prashad, which is an umbrella organization, which also controls the Bajrang Dal, which is the uh, wing of the younger people, younger Hindu who are very motivated and who are uh, religious uh, military fighters and who actually perpetrate these crimes. And then there is a political wing, which is BJP. So RSS is basically the progenitor uh, of all this hierarchy, which actually it, which has actually imbibed and which has taken over the complete society. So I retrieve this society from this radicalism and this Hindu tinge. I think it is uh, not possible. And another thing which you were saying that even police and uh, the um, civil armed forces, uh, they are a silent uh, witness to all this which is going on. And rather, this, they are actually involved in the custodial killing. Uh, it, just, it just reminds me that in 2021, there were 143 custodial killings of Muslims who were actually the victims of violence, which were there in the police custody. And in 2022, the custodial killings were over 200 uh, of the Muslims who were there in the custodies of the, of the Muslims, so, uh, of the police. So actually, if you see the civil services of India, if you see the police services of India, or if you see the judiciary, so every, all these three segments of these uh, public servants in Indian polity have become uh, Hindu-minded and Hinduvata followers to their deep core, to the, to, the, to the skins and bone of their existence. And if this has happened and if this has, uh, this has been done, and ironically, I am very strange and, you know, uh, perplexed to see that even Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, United Nations, no one condemns this. Whatever is being done, it is just cosmetic in nature and it is just, you know, at the veneer of uh, the issue. No one goes deep and no one gives actually. Organizations, do we continuously see uh, them raising the voice uh, against what is being perpetrated towards minorities, specifically towards Muslims in uh, various reports? Uh, so that is what international human rights organizations can do. They can highlight the things which are going on in a specific area. Uh, so when it comes to taking a concrete action, it happens to be the responsibility of the major powers, the United Nations um, and the international community. So um, uh, when and how the conscience of the international community uh, could wake up, uh, what could be done? What is required for that? I think, you know, uh, uh, presently the magic of Indian economy, you know, this is a, this is the age in which we are living in a new liberalism. Rather, we are moving beyond the new liberalism. A new concept of geopolitics is emerging. In this concept of geopolitics, the importance of India vis-a-vis uh, the being a counterweight to China and being also a counterweight to uh, other uh, areas of influence which are emerging in the global architecture. So importance of India has risen to a level that I think those who are uh, responsible or those who are actually the anchors upon which the international uh, human rights system rests, they are very reluctant to admonish, to actually ask India that what they are doing. So if this continues, what will happen? You see, uh, already the Indian society has become a vigilante. We have heard about the cow vigilantes and a movement of ghar wapsi in which uh, the, uh, in they say that every uh, person living in India is actually ancestrally a Hindu. So he has to be converted back to Hinduism. And that conversion, they don't call it conversion. They, they call it purification or shuddhi in which the person, you know, he has to be, uh, he has to, uh, he has to become what he was there centuries ago. So this concept is actually uh, Hinduism is mythology, and now the Hinduvita concept is blending that mythology with an ideology. So if that is the thing, then it is very difficult, even from outsiders, from the global powers, from those who, who can monitor, from those who can actually. Uh, assert some pressure to tell India to behave in a way and to, uh, you know, rectify these issues. I think it is very difficult to be very realistic and to be uh, very agile and very, you know, congenial on the issue. I would say that it is, uh, to me, it seems very difficult. 
Uh, right, Mr. Malik, this accountability has to start from somewhere. We, uh, we know that there is Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the, uh, the purposes and the principles of the UN Charter, uh, also the relevant international covenants regarding the human rights, the civil and the political rights, also the religious rights. I mean, uh, the international community could start from somewhere uh, if we... Um, presume that there are economic interests of the major powers associated with India at this point in history, but certain entities or the people who are involved in blatant violation of human rights. Um, just as uh, Mr. Siddiq was saying that after that very Gujarat massacre, the US denied uh, Modi the visa. visa. So uh, such type of actions could be done against other entities and uh, those people who are involved. No, uh, I don't think so that in the foreseeable future uh, there would be any pressure being exerted by all these players because uh, the uh, po regional politics uh, and whatever is happening around us vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, China, the war in Ukraine, uh, American uh, focus, uh, it gives ample space to uh, Indian government uh, to do whatever they want. And that is what they are trying to utilize. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Muslim Ummah, uh, if at all any such thing really exists in real politics, uh, they are also n not giving any attention to this issue. Rather, we see there is an you know, exaggerated level of cooperation, uh, economic cooperation with India, the trade, now, just uh, recently, uh, you, we have seen uh, that Indian rupee is being recognized as a you know, uh, valid uh, uh, exchange currency in so many c countries. Uh, uh, one of the states, you know, they are going to open up the Indian cricket in the uh, country which had no history of cricket because it brings revenue and it brings an you know, image building for them uh, being a, a liberal uh, Muslim uh, you know, kingdom or a, a society. So every country is narrowly focused on their own economic interest. So nobody is going, whatever you have mentioned, all these books, so all the these So the international community is not going to take any concrete action, the major powers are concerned with their yeah. economic interests and uh, the people over there which are being continuously persecuted, you, uh, as uh, you uh, already said, they uh, haven't given any sort of concerted reaction against this sort of treatment. So, uh, what's the future of Muslims in uh, India? It's such, uh, it's the biggest minority over there, over 200 only, uh, million see, Muslims. It's not only in India. Uh, uh, probably once uh, Muslims, uh, the entity of being a Muslim, you know, that comes in any context, in, in discussion or in limelight or in any focus. Unfortunately, so many countries uh, we have seen that Otherwise, you know, they are very vocal about uh, human rights. But once that same thing happens to a Muslim or an act being done by Muslim, he or she would be treated differently. Uh, my only hope is that if there is a new regional alliance uh, against the unipolar uh, world, probably uh, that could, you know, relieve some, uh, you know, support which is being meted out to Indian government right now and that would create a window for the Muslims in general and Muslims in uh, India and Indian occupied uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Well, right, Mr. Siddiq, as you were already mentioning that it was because of that vision uh, by the forefathers that uh, the Muslims of the subcontinent got a separate homeland and they saw beforehand what was about to happen with Muslims after the true colors of Indians or uh, the uh, Hindus in particular. Uh, uh, would come to the light. Uh, but now when we specifically talk about this point, this time in history, when uh, Muslims happen to be the largest minority over there in India, uh, 200 million, around 200 plus million Muslims are living there. Yes. So what are the options at their hands? Uh, are we expecting, uh, are the Hindu ex uh, extremists expecting uh, an exodus of all those Muslims? And where would they go? And who is going to cater to such a huge population? <clears throat> I don't think this is going to last for a very long period of time. And uh, yes, the Muslims are being subjected to unprecedented repression and suppression. But the world is taking note of it. Although the big powers have their own interest attached to India, 
India is a big country. It is a rising economic power. Uh, it, it has a uh, you know, regional role to play. And at global level, of course, the Indian influence is expanding. And uh, they are also aspiring to be a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, although uh, <clears throat> China and some other countries are opposed to it. Pakistan is also included in that category of country. But Indians are trying hard to become the member of the United Nations Security Council. And a space is being created for them. By Given some this powers. track record, With would that be possible? That's, that's the hmm. reason. That is the reason. China, Pakistan, Turkey and some other countries are opposing it. And, and there is a group of countries globally which is not permitting India to become a permanent member of the Security Council, yes, with this track record, suppressing the minorities, having disputes with all regional countries, neighboring countries, Pakistan, China, um, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Maldives. Maldives is a country where the Indian landed their forces and they suppressed uh, the people of Maldives. And they have also sent forces to Sri Lanka. And they were, uh, you know, they were trying to incite terrorism in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, so you know, the, their track record is, is extremely condemnable. For this reason, I think, uh, India stands exposed uh, in the eye of the world. Uh, another important issue is that Moody government by resorting to these tactics and uh, by adopting the philosophy of the Hindutva, Hindu extremism, has actually taken off that uh, the veneer of uh, secularism. You know, the Indians always sold the idea that they were secular, they were the biggest democracy in the world, and that all the minorities are safe in India. That was the mantra used by Congress for so many decades. Now it stands exposed that it, India is an extremist Hindu state. It does not allow other minorities to live there, to, to practice their religious beliefs, and that has been uh, you know, exposed to the world. But I think the, uh, the Muslims all over the world, particularly the Kashmiris, who are being subjected to torture, repression, and terrorism, their diaspora all over the world is making huge efforts to expose Indians. And uh, in all major capitals of the world, the Kashmiris are very active in the United Nations and elsewhere. They are raising their voice. So the, they are uh, raising voice. We have seen uh, uh, the Khalistan movement. There have been referendums yes. that have taken place in the major uh, capitals of the world. Um, uh, do you think the Kashmiris should also organize such uh, referendums which might have huge symbolic significance to interest? Kashmiris, I think they are doing a lot. You know, uh, the, the Kashmiri leaders, uh, the, the Kashmiri young people studying abroad in the United States, Canada, UK, Germany and France. I've been to these countries. and. Uh, they are very active, they are raising the voice, and they are exposing the Indian atrocities against the Muslims and particularly against the Kashmiris. But uh, for the time being, India uh, is, is uh, a need, a strategic need of some countries, and that's why they are silent. Uh, in the 90s and uh, in 80s, the, in, uh, in, uh, the United States of America and European Union were very harsh in criticizing the Indian atrocities against Muslims, particularly and Kashmiris. Now, uh, now after 9-11, the whole scenario changed. But still, there are human rights watch, uh, human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and other uh, organizations, they are taking note of it. The Indian track record, particularly the track record of Modi government is very tarnished as far as the human rights are concerned. So this is not going to last for a very long time because the world community is not going to uh, you know, f give way or, or they are not going to uh, forgive or they are not going to abdicate from the responsibility of strengthening the human rights or else they have to say that, oh, we are not the uh, preacher and practitioners of human rights. If they are, they have to put pressure on India to stop this extremism, to stop this violence 
to stop this torture against Muslims and other minorities. Uh, right. Uh, Mr. Abid, we recently saw the Human Rights Watch, the Universal Periodic Review uh, at the Human Rights Council uh, also took place. It also recommended a number of um, actions to the Indian authorities uh, vis-a-vis the rights of minorities uh, to get uh, those particular action plans implemented. Uh, there could be a sort of a mechanism uh, that the Human Rights uh, Council uh, could make India to implement that. Um, how could that be done? Is there any possibility uh, that these actions, uh, action plans which have been recommended by the Human Rights Council uh, could be implemented and Indian authorities could be made to do those? Yeah, this could be done. Uh, but before commenting on this, I would like to, with due respect to both ABM Saab and Javed Saab, I would, first of all, I would say that uh, there is nothing, uh, there is no such thing as a Muslim Ummah, to be very straight right now. There are Muslim countries, uh, yes, there are, and that too, all the Muslim countries are divided into group, two groups. Uh, half of the group is part of the Western world and the other half is the victim of the, you know, uh, uh, you know, aggression of a Western world in one form or the other. So, Muslim Ummah will I don't think so will contribute in any way in you know pressurizing India. It is really difficult. And the other part is that uh, as Javed Sah was saying that eventually the world conscience will you know rise to the occasion and uh, uh, international bodies of human rights and you know uh, 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 of, of the public interest, global public interest will rise to the occasion and ask India to behave. But actually, India is portraying this complete issue as not a human rights issue. They are portraying it as a communal issue. And they are saying that we are a diversified society where 200 languages are uh, uh, official languages there of different states. And so this diversif because of this diversification, we have communal issue. And they are also portraying this as a communal issue. And as far as you said that uh, what international bodies are likely to do, I think if they want to uh, contribute and they want to uh, uh, play their part in solving this conundrum in the polity of India. I think they can do that, and they can uh, uh, they can only uh, uh, they can only uh, persuade India by uh, uh, the means of their relations, especially uh, the five or seven major powers. Uh, uh, if they can persuade India that they have to give a space to their minorities, and they have to you know, settle these issues in a way that uh, these communal issues, which India says is a communal issue, not, this should not be taking a, a, taking a, a scenario in which basic and massive human rights violations are uh, being perpetrated against a minority, which is the Muslim. I think that is possible, but uh, immediately that possibility and how that mechanism will function, how this is going to unfold, uh, I really can't comment that how India, because this, that uh, depends upon the Indian authority that how they respond. You're saying something? Or also the... Sorry, uh, I can't hear it. So, Abid, can, can, can there be a possibility that this uh, particular pressure could be built through diplomatic means or uh, the punitive actions are the only measure that can put pressure on Indian authorities uh, to behave towards minorities? Yes, this, this can be, uh, this pressure can be built through diplomatic means and plus there is another phenomena which can, if, if it can take place, this pressure can be built from within the India. And actually India is divided into uh, two types of major states. One is the Hindutva states, which is UP, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, where extreme Hinduism is being practiced as a political and religious ideology. And the other is the Hindi belt which comprises of Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Haryana, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh. This is the place where Muslim majority also dwells and this is the area where Muslims live. If they realize that they have to actually, uh, you know, get themselves activated in terms of uh, political awareness of there being a separate community and with the rights, with political rights and they gather and they actually somehow pressurize the electoral of the India, only then I think the pressure can build. And once the pressure from uh, internal uh, lines is built within the India, only then India will respond to the external pressures. 
Uh, right, uh, Mr. Malik, uh, there is a report by an NGO, SPECT Foundation, that talks about uh, Muslims suffering the abject uh, multidimensional poverty uh, in states of Bihar, West Bengal, and Assam. Um, it uh, goes on to say that these particular districts lack educational institutions, health centers, literacy rates are lower, high dropout rates are there, few work opportunities are there, and lack of basic infrastructure. And these communities are also facing the devastation caused by the floods also. Now, uh, can any humanitarian organization uh, take the lead role in at least reaching out to these marginalized people? Yes, that is possible. But again, any INGO or any uh, uh, such organi humanitarian organization going into such a volatile areas, uh, their success will depend on the cooperation of the district or that provincial or state. But uh, we have seen international organizations also um, reaching out to marginalized people in the war ravaged countries also. But uh, they were under the umbrella of uh, United Nations or being supported and funded by uh, even uh, uh, major countries and uh, the superpowers. In this particular case, uh, probably they do not enjoy that kind of support. So uh, India very selectively allows the media to be th th there wherever they want. Uh, they deny access of international media to uh, uh, occupied uh, Kashmir. And uh, similarly, any organization which would be working, uh, trying to uh, penetrate into these regions, they would, I think, have a lot of resistance. Uh, unless that as a part of their media campaign, they want to give a limited access to portray to the international community that yes, uh, I mean we are open and we are very uh, we, we provide very conducive environment for any such organization to come and work and uh, uh, carry out such program. So, but uh, the point which is given by uh, Mr. Abid, I uh, uh, fully agree with that. That if somehow uh, these uh, uh, communities where there are uh, Muslims are in uh, you know in some, some pockets they are in majority or they have a sizable number if they organize themselves and they uh, play at the time of you know their state polls or uh, uh, for their uh, Lok Sabha uh, polls that can be used as an instrument to exert pressure because whatever it is still uh, maintaining a posture of being a democracy uh, it it is a requirement of the Indian Union. So uh, I think that is an instrument which can be played uh, sensibly to build a pressure. Just like uh, the BGP, uh, you know, they conduct the election on the uh, agenda of anti-Pakistan, Pakistan bashing and uh, Muslim uh, bashing. Uh, similarly, that man can be countered in the same coins if they organize themselves on these lines. Right, Mr. Sadiq, um, uh, how difficult do you think it could be for the humanitarian organizations to reach out to those marginalized people, particularly in these states of Assam, West Bengal, uh, where this particular foundation says that uh, Muslims in particular are facing multi-dimensional abject poverty? It is quite difficult, <coughs> obviously, uh, for so many reasons. Uh, but I think uh, if, if the world, I mean the Islamic world, the Muslim world had organized itself uh, to reach out to these people, marginalized Muslims, and those who have been deprived of their fundamental rights, you know, economic rights and social rights. Uh, that could have been done. Um, the, uh, the important um, uh, Islamic countries who are oil-rich countries have a great influence uh, the world over. They could have uh, exerted a lot of influence on Indian government. Um, and we have seen, unfortunately, in the last few years, that contrary to the expectations of the Indian Muslims and Muslims at, uh, at large globally, they have behaved in a very, very disappointing way. And it looked that uh, the, the rights of the Muslims um, were not on their mind or they were, they were not on the top of agenda when they were dealing with India. And uh, Mr. Moody was given honors and awards by some of very important uh, Islamic countries of the world. Uh, that was very, very disappointing. But <clears throat> still, I think uh, there are some elements in India. The Congress, for instance, which is a big, bigger 
a big challenge for Modi and Communist Party of India. Some other parties, smaller parties in India, are opposed to this Hindutva philosophy. And some other intellectuals that I, I mentioned, uh, Arundhati Rai and Gautam and other people, they are also opposing it. And there are liberal elements in India who want Modi to put an end to this anti-Muslim policy and uh, stop fanning the communis communalism in India and that will lead to bloodshed. Some of the analysts in India are uh, apprehensive that this policy of Modi can lead to civil war, to bloodshed and unrest and anarchy in India at, at some stage. So I think that is uh, one thing that can deter Modi and the coming elections will clearly indicate as to what is the trend in India. Um, uh, you know, the, the challenge is very big and I think Congress and other parties are going to oppose the, um, the Hindu manifesto or the man manifesto of uh, Modi and its Hindutva party and BJP. BJP has also uh, failed on so many fronts. There are huge corruption charges against Modi and his government. So it, there are so many vulnerabilities of the uh, Modi government. Let's see how these liberal parties, Congress and others, behave in the coming elections. Right, Mr. Abid, uh, your quick take regarding the Muslims in these particular states of Bihar, West Bengal and Assam where they are facing multi-dimensional uh, poverty. Uh, if the humanitarian organizations uh, would be facing difficulty in reaching out to uh, these people and if there is no government support coming to them, even the uh, international community is not reaching out to them, what options do you think uh, are left at their hands to uh, at least kind of generate that very economic activity for themselves? I think the only option left with them is to organize themselves politically, number one. And number two is to uh, ride this uh, wave of progress and prosperity which other middle class or lower middle class of uh, the other Indian origin, they are uh, you know, trying to ride and progress themselves. That is the only option. No outside help can immediately reach there. They have to improve uh, themselves by, I think the only option is to organize themselves. And as far as the BJP is concerned or RSS is concerned, I just give a, a small comment that annual congregation of uh, RSS is annually held at Tripura, uh, where at least five lakh, more than, more than five lakh uh, uh, appointment holders and office holders of RSS, Bajrang Dal, and BJP, they attend that congregation. In that congregation, there is no idol or anything else is placed except a map of the whole India in which Pakistan is shown as part of the greater India. So this is the ideology which they are actually worshipping. And this is the aim, this is the actually overall uh, their objective, strategic objective of this emerging strategic elite of right wing, extreme right wing. So I think in this contest, in this background, in this backdrop, this, uh, we can, uh, a lesson for us is to organize ourselves here in Pakistan, and make ourselves economically strong so that we could, uh, so that the Muslims in India can emulate us and can see toward us as a, uh, as a hope for their sustenance, for their survival, and their, for their uh, well-being. The writer, Mr. Abid Latif Sindhu, senior analyst, joining us on Skype. Thank you very much for being with us on the show. Uh, we were joined in the studio by Air Vice Marshal, retired Jaz Malik, senior analyst. Thank you very much thank for you. your time also. And Mr. Javed Siddiq, senior journalist. Mr. Siddiq, thank you very much for your right. time also for being with us on Views on News tonight. We really appreciate that. Given the circumstances, the kind of discrimination Muslims are facing uh, in India under the BJP, which is led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, it happens to be the responsibility of the international community, especially the major powers, uh, to pressure India in order to fulfill those international obligations to uphold all those human rights and provide the Muslims a safe and secure environment, not only to live, but also to thrive within India. Otherwise, it would be too late. With that note, uh, we come to the end of today's show. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves.